It is Wednesday, March 6th. It is 1 o'clock in the afternoon. I would like to welcome everybody to the City of Tallahassee City Commission workshop. We have two items on the workshop agenda today. Mr. Manager, are there, excuse me, um, yeah, Mr. Manager, are there any modifications to the agenda? No, sir. No, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Um, we're at the point in the agenda for citizen input. Uh, Mr. Treasurer Clerk, do we have any? Mayor, we have one uh, speaker, Stanley Sims. Okay. Reverend Sims, good afternoon. Welcome. How are you doing? You know man? the drill, your name and address, <laughs> keep it to three minutes, and I ask that you keep it germane to the topics of the uh, workshop itself, too. Yes. My name is Stanley Sims. I'm at 1320 Avondale Way. And um, as you discuss this optic program that um, the city is about to launch in, I really hope that you would launch this project same upon the basis that you launch um, um, utilities. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, I mean that you don't have to live in the city in order to be mandated to buy city utilities. As I am an example, I am not a city resident, but I'm mandated to buy. I don't have a choice. I can't get talcum. I'm mandated. So in other words, if you decide to go through with this, this would be another business venture that the city of Tallahassee will go into, and I would like to opt in. But unfortunately, this would be another thing where it's taxation without representation. So I don't know if regulation is going to fall in effect with that. But as you go down this road, I would like for the um, you all to address the matter. Would this be something like garbage where it's mandatory or can a person opt in or can they opt out? Um, I'm not speaking against this. Uh, I wanted to make very clear, but I did want to make you aware that there are city customers that will be affected that don't live within the city. Thank you. Thank you. Points well taken. Do we have anybody else from the public that's here that has not had an opportunity to fill out a speaker's card that would like to speak? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on. We're on our first item, uh, 3.01 for discussion. And before we jump in, let me take a second to welcome uh, two outstanding members of our delegation, Representative Ramon Alexander and Representative Lorraine Osley. I guess the state is at a grinding halt right now while you are joining <laughs> us. But nonetheless, welcome to your city hall and your city chambers, and we appreciate y'all participating in this uh, in this item. So with that, I'll turn it over to the city manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll be really brief. We've got a full agenda today for your workshop, and, and I'm glad you recognize the, uh, the uh, co-quarterback uh, leaders for our purpose-built communities effort. And that's the nature of this workshop update. Uh, there's been quite a bit of work uh, dealing with um, uh, the, implement, the potential implementation of a purpose-built community model in our South City neighborhood. And I'd like to welcome David Edwards, who's the CEO of Purpose-Built Communities from Atlanta. I appreciate you being here today, David, to give us comments. And, and Michael Parker, our director of um, uh, community housing, he's here as well. And he, as you know, Michael uh, lives and breathes this topic uh, and these types of topics, and uh, I really appreciate his support on that. And I know they're going to tag team this effort and walk through the presentation. <clears throat> I'd also like to recognize, and I'm not sure I saw her, but I expect her to be here, Brenda Williams uh, with the Tallahassee Housing Authority. That's um, a big piece of uh, this puzzle, uh, as well as our education community and, and potentially health care. So uh, lots of people involved. I know we're going to recognize uh, those folks that have been participating, but I just wanted to take that opportunity to set it up and uh, turn it over to Michael to lead the presentation. Well, thank you, Michael, Mayor, members of the City Commission. We're very pleased to be able to give you an update on the status of uh, this effort that's really been going, was initiated back in 2017. Um, I think all the members of the team have been introduced to you. What we're going to do today is kind of walk you just very briefly through uh, the purpose-built process where we are as far as the targeted community of South City, we'll talk a little bit about why that community is the focus of our efforts. Um, and then we'll talk about the, um, where we are in terms of setting up the community quarterback organization and laying out what the next steps would be should we choose to go forward with this effort. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to, um, to, to David to um, initiate the first discussion here. Well, thank you, Michael, and thank David, you. David, welcome back to Tallahassee. Well, too. thank you very much. Glad it's a pleasure to be us. here. Yeah, thank you. 
it, uh, it's a little colder than I thought it would be, but, um, <laughs> but um, it's, it's great to be here and I, I appreciate the commission and you, Mr. Mayor, inviting us down again to talk about this, uh, what we think could be a trans transformational project for South City. So we're really excited about giving you a little bit of a briefing today. We have um, made a huge amount of progress since we started about 18 months ago, and so we're, we're happy to be here to, to be able to report back on that. So what we've, we do today, I think, is just review the goals again to make sure that we're all uh, grounded in what we're trying to accomplish here as a, as a community and from our perspective, from the Purpose Built Community's perspective, really uh, eliminating the cycle of intergenerational poverty in, in, in uh, distressed neighborhoods like South City. So if you, if you just flip to slide three in your package, uh, this is our um, model that we're using around the country. As, you, as you'll remember, uh, Purpose Built Communities is we are a nonprofit. We provide free uh, consulting services to local leaders in trying to implement this particular model for neighbor revitalization. And we now have 23 projects up and running around the country and another 45 or so in development. Uh, Tallahassee would be in that development category. In, in these uh, efforts, we are trying to implement a model that was originally developed in Atlanta over 23 years ago. It has five components. The first is that we focus on defined distressed neighborhoods and so neighborhoods um, in the range, usually between three and 10,000 residents. And then in those neighborhoods, we help those local leaders put together uh, interventions in three different areas. The first is in mixed income housing and commercial development. So injecting into these neighborhoods high quality mixed income housing at a scale that would help trigger other private investments in real estate in those neighborhoods, um, while at the same time ensuring that the, these neighborhoods remain affordable. The second area is in cradle to college education, where we help the local leaders put together a plan to ensure that every child in, these, in this neighborhood has access to an A-plus early learning through high school seat. And then in the third category, which we call community wellness, is uh, the best way to think about that is that we're looking for investments that leverage the assets of the particular neighborhood. So every neighborhood has some set of assets, could be location or public infrastructure, green space, um, things like YMCA's, Boys and Girls Clubs, uh, or, and addresses deficits of those neighborhoods. That could be a lack of health access points. It could be a food desert, so you want to bring in grocery stores, those kinds of things. So those are the three kind of programmatic initiatives that we help the local team put together, identify partners to implement them and to finance them. And then the last component of this model, which is really what we call our secret sauce, and it's really the key to success and what is really what differentiates this particular approach to community revitalization from others around the country is, is this thing we call a community quarterback organization. So in all 23 of our projects, we have launched 23 independent 501c3s that we call community quarterbacks who are responsible for really being the voice of the community, making sure that the community and its residents own this effort, and also to collaborate with the partners to make sure they're working together and, and th that this work is done in a collaborative, coordinated way. We have, as I mentioned earlier, we have begun, if you go to the next slide, we've, we have, um, we be began this about 18 months ago, and we have a process, this is our, this is our due diligence process laid out on this slide, that, that we take these communities through, and uh, we have, we are deep into this, into the third box here in Tallahassee, and are feeling very very uh, confident that we can develop these at scale investments in the three categories I just described. Um, we are really at a point now where we need local the local leadership in this community quarterback organization, with whom we can then. Uh, push ahead and accelerate the, both the planning and the implementation of the, of the community vision. So that's, that's where you are today, and, and, and assuming we can move through the rest of this process, the, the, we would then invite this group into our network. So that would, that would mean you become a member of the personal community network. We continue to support you, again, on a pro bono basis as long as it exists. You get the access to best practices that are being uh, implemented around the country from our network. You get your executive director will get professional development and training from us over the course of every year. We'll do strategic planning, we'll do operating planning. So we, we continue to provide support, but really we're at a point in this process of like we'd like to say we need a client now. We've been working with kind of part-time leaders, some of whom are around the table here, but eventually we need to have a kind of a full-time person who's waking up every day 
making sure that this, that this work is successful. So I'll turn it over to Michael to talk a little bit about the South City geography. And, and yes, so I'm going to talk a little bit about South City and why this is the focus. Uh, when we, going back to 2017, when um, this actually uh, came to the City Commission as part of uh, really a focus on affordable housing, there was an affordable housing work group that had been put together to make recommendations about how we could accelerate affordable housing initiatives in the community. And one of those was to come up with a pilot project for multifamily affordable housing um, and look at models around the country where mixed, where we could basically leverage private sector and public sector dollars successfully. And it was in that initiative where we looked um, at some of the projects which Purpose Built had done in other communities where they had been very effective and usually had been using um, public housing as the kind of the basis for their, their launch pad. And through uh, um, some happy circumstances, it happened at the same time that the, the uh, Tallahassee Public Housing Authority was in the process of evaluating the redevelopment of the Orange Avenue um, um, public housing complex. And they had gone through a selection process and selected uh, Columbia Residential out of Atlanta as to be the lead entity to help them re redevelop develop a redevelopment plan and launch it for the Orange Avenue apartments. Well, it also turns out that um, Resi um, Columbia Residential has been a key partner with purpose-built communities on a number of their projects, including their, I would say, their flagship project, which is in Atlanta, but also in the projects they've done in New Orleans, um, the projects that they're underway right now in Lyft Orlando. So with that in mind, uh, kind of why South City? Well, this map that you see up uh, on your, your um, in your package, that was actually developed by the residents of um, Orange Avenue through part of the community engagement process that was that we went through with how what would they like to see as part of the redevelopment of that prop um, that property. And in that, they broadened the view and looked at that corridor. What kinds of things would they like to see be part of the larger redevelopment of that community? And so you see up there on here, there are a lot of the things that are um, that we're all familiar with. But it goes actually farther back than that. For, if you go back to the, uh, the late 1990s, when we had launched a, uh, the Neighborhood Renaissance Program, um, one of the first neighborhoods we selected for the Neighborhood Renaissance Program was Appalachia Ridge. Um, and that was a collaborative process that had been where the neighborhood came and identified what their priorities were. So then in around 2000, when the redevelopment district was adopted, the boundaries of the CRA were purposely drawn to go into the south part of the community, specifically to aid some of the initiatives that were going on there. You look at what was done with the extension of the Blueprint 2000. There are a number of capital improvement projects which are focused on this particular area, and that came from the community input that went through that process. So it's no, it's no, uh, secret as to why South City is, is one of the focuses of here, but also for uh, several years ago when we launched an initiative for the Promise Zone community um, effort, which was being uh, sponsored by the, the federal government, we identified a number of census tracts which by their statistics represented some of the most you know, challenged areas in our community, and this particular area was one of those. Census tracts 10.01 and 10.02, which are represented on this map, they have some really challenging uh, statistics. And just to give you just an overview of them, you know, in this area that's being highlighted, there's a, there's a population of about 6,400 people in that area. Um, interestingly enough, almost 2,000 of those people are children. So it's a high, there's a high youth movement there. The, um, it's 73% African American. Um, it has an, is a 2017, it had an 18% unemployment rate. Well, if you consider that this county's unemployment rate is less than 4%, then that gives you an idea about what, how serious that issue is in this particular community. Some other issues that are in, 44% of the population live in poverty, and then 65% of the population are classified as low income. So low income is 80% or less of area median income. Poverty is 50% or less of area median income. So um, this area has a lot of particular challenges. Um, so that is one of the reasons why when we brought, um, started co having our conversations with Purpose Built Community and we looked at the examples that they've done in Atlanta and we saw that their format is really more, their program as has been referenced before is not just about building the housing. That was the element that brought us to their, um, brought them to our attention. 
but it's the whole idea about building an overall model for how you can actually revitalize a community. So with that, I'm, we're going to talk a little bit about those three elements that were mentioned before um, as far as where we are with those three major elements in relationship to South City. And I'll talk a little bit about the housing, and then Loran and, um, and, and Ramon would talk about um, some of the, and David could talk about the education and the wellness component. As far as the housing concern, as I mentioned, that Orange Avenue is really what we're looking at as the springboard for this whole redevelopment effort. There are 200 units of housing in the, public, in the Orange Avenue project. The plan that was developed in conjunction with the housing authority and the residents calls for that to be redeveloped and replaced with 390 units of mixed low income and mixed income housing. So a portion of that would be to, that plan will be to replace the existing 200 units of, a, of public housing. It will also include elements of low income housing, which would be predominantly done through low income housing tax credits, as well as market rate housing. So that is, uh, that's really the, the bigger, the major element on the housing component. Where we are with that is, is the, the master plan has been approved by the housing authority. Um, we're, now we're trying to go through the implementation. Some of you may be aware that we worked with the developer in this last cycle for low income housing tax credits. The city actually pledged $420,000 in conjunction with the CRA, which was a local match, which would have basically gave our project a higher priority in the valuation process. Unfortunately, a higher priority didn't get us there because it is highly competitive and it is done somewhat through a lottery system. So we were unsuccessful. That was back in December of this year, those announcements were made. So we're working with the developer again to prepare ourselves for the next cycle. That the, the whole development program will take a number of years to complete. Um, it's, right now they're looking at dump three phases is what they're expecting it to be. While the total cost is not finalized yet, to give you an idea, the 100 unit project that we were sponsoring, which would have been the first component of it, of that 390 use, un, units would have been about um, $19 million. So it is a substantial amount of investment that ultimately we'll be looking for. And that is really, um, Gives, would, would give this community quarterback and this effort in Tallahassee a real jump start because we're so already, already so heavily invested in the affordable housing component. But the other elements, um, um, which include the education and the wellness, is something that other elements of the groups in the community have been working on as we've been evaluating this. So with that, I'll turn it over to David and Loran to talk a little bit about the public education efforts and the wellness. I'll, I'll talk about the education piece, and if you can jump in on early learning, if you'd like, Lauren. But the, um, we've, we've had some great conversations and meetings both with the school superintendent and with the school board. We had a, I was here just last week, in fact, with the school board in a work session to talk about Hartsfield, the vision for this neighborhood, how best to integrate Hartsfield into that approach to creating this seamless pipeline. And just to emphasize the point, what, we would, what we're trying to build is a an experience for a child from the time that they are born to the time they graduate high school. They've been able to have been, been supported through and uh, delivered to through a seamless educational pipeline, early learning through K through eight, then high school. And, uh, and we're, we think we've had the uh, school principal and her team up to visit us in Atlanta we, uh, on a, for a full day to talk about education approaches. Um, uh, we've had this several meetings with the superintendent and we are now working through really the, a process to put a plan in place that would deliver that vision of this of this seamless pipeline. So we're, we're in, we have not got a specific proposal approved yet, but we are uh, very hopeful that we'll be able to do that shortly. And on early learning, you want yeah, to describe early learning? Yeah, on the early learning piece, I mean, that's sort of, as everyone knows, that's sort of how I, I got to the table here because that's been my focus for a long time. And um, we've, you know, given the statistics of 2,000 kids in this South City area, um, we have been, um, a, lot, a number of us have been really looking to try to create a model early learning center in that neighborhood. Um, and the, the, the vision would be something that could be served, served not just the children in the neighborhood, but that could be a teaching facility and um, much along the lines of an educare facility that I've visited in Miami um, that has a teaching, uh, the second floor is all, um, it's, it's for professional development of all the child care um, teachers in the whole, all Miami-Dade County come and are trained there. So it is not just lifting up the, the children that are at that center, but all of the, the children throughout the, 
the community. Um, so there has been a, um, an ongoing uh, discussion with Educare, which is a um, child care entity out of Chicago um, that does, it comes in and helps sort of go th somewhat along the lines of what a purpose built does, um, works with um, an entity to, to create the, the, the financing and all the, all the pieces that are necessary for a, a very high quality early learning center. Um, we have gone through an a, um, assessment with Educare and we're in those conversations um, about you know, is this community ready? It, it includes um, Tim Center, um, and Head Start, Early Head Start, the school district, anybody who serves children in the neighborhood. Um, so the idea would be to piece all of those um, existing funding streams together um, to, to ultimately create a model early learning center that would be the pipeline into Hartsfield. So, um, there's been discussions with the school superintendent and the and the district about that Wesson site. Um, right now, there are already some children that go. There are some early learning um, slots there, um, and that you know that's a right across the street from Orange Avenue. It's in the Opportunity Zone. Um, so those conversations are all ongoing, but um, we're very promising. Um, and uh, I think you know. The purpose bill has convinced me. Well, I always believed that early learning was that, that's all we needed to focus on. But David has convinced me that if you know if, you don't, if they don't have a kindergarten and first grade class to matriculate into that's all, that that is high quality, then all the investment in those early years um, is is for naught. So um, just put all these pieces together, and it's a very exciting prospect for for the kids in South City. And that's what makes this work so hard because now you have to have other entities collaborating. In this case, the district with an early learning center, which means you. Probably need some policies in place that allow you to do that. So, that, so this is part of what takes so long to get this kind of these kinds of models implemented. But we're we're encouraged by that. Um, but where we are, um, early learning is central to the success of this work. Getting children um, prepared to learn by the time they get to kindergarten is maybe the most important thing you can do to promote the health of kids and families. So we're we're excited about the progress there. We think there are, there are going to be some um, attractive options for how to deliver that. Um, and and I'd say um, on the, the third category, I don't know if Representative Alexander, you wanted to add anything on early learning, but um, on, on uh, community wellness, one of, the, one of the things you do have, one of the assets you have here are some pretty um, impressive anchor institutions, both in universities and in hospital med and medical care. And we've, we've had uh, extensive meetings both with the universities, FAMU and FSU, and the community college, as well as um, uh, we were last week. We had, I guess, 20 or 25 healthcare professionals in the room talking about this project. Uh, we're we're uh, encouraged that we will have a strategy that in, that it leverages those assets, their leadership, their capabilities, um, some of their resources, perhaps, in delivering uh, some of the, the investments we're talking about to, in in South City. Uh, so, just to give you some examples. I, I don't know. If some of you may be aware, but in in our project in Orlando. Florida Hospital is um, sponsoring really and paying for the construction and the operation of an early learning center in uh, in the Lyft Orlando neighborhood that we're working in. Um, it's, a, it's a great example of hospitals understanding how important it is to, to eliminate the social determinants of, or address the social determinants of health by making sure that children are, are in high quality early learning because we know we get better outcomes for those kids health-wise if they go through high quality early learning. So it's a great example of of an anchor institution, which is really you know, going outside of what they would normally do. They're, this is not a healthcare investment, this is an education investment, but a hospital is making it. And so we, we are increasingly encouraged that uh, anchor institutions like hospitals and universities will broaden their scope and how they support this kind of work. So it's, uh, so it's exciting. David, has Bond and Neighborhood Health Center been involved in these discussions? We've, yeah, we've had, uh, so with the district with, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. With um, yeah, they, they were both at this meeting after we had last week, and, and uh, we're uh, as as we're I think about every healthcare institution that uh, that is uh, serving the city. So it was very um, very productive meeting, and we're uh, we're hopeful to continue progress there. But Bond is is already serving that area. They're located absolutely, out there. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Bond and South absolutely. City area. Yeah, I want to make sure they're involved. And, and also, just to add, at the meeting last week, Neighborhood Health identified that they had actually acquired um, a parcel over in that area, and they're looking to expand service to the old Babcock yeah. furniture yeah. cycle. So, yes, they were part of, of that discussion. And I, to me, I think that's one of the, the, the most instructive um, applications of, of purpose-built 
value to this is that we have all these health resources that are that are in the neighborhood yet we have so many of those um, citizens that are showing up in the emergency room at DMH and, and if there if we can figure out you know through best practices how to leverage all of those existing resources um, I mean there, there's that that's a win-win for everyone so commensurate with, with us working on the, the very elements, we've also been now working on um, trying to put together the community quarterback structure, that would, which is an integral part of, of the whole um, uh, purpose-built model. So that's where uh, Alec, Representative Alexander and Representative um, Osley have been really helpful. Um, and I thought I'd like David to kind of talk a little bit about the role that they play, and then also if, if, the, if our representatives would talk a little about what efforts they've been having to kind of pull together a good cohort of members of the community that kind of make up the kind of community quarterback organization that would make this successful. Thanks, Michael. I'm happy to do that. So if you look at this next slide, it, I, I apologize if you can't see it uh, clearly, but because it is a complicated slide. But we, what we try to hear, do in one graphic is to kind of capture the role of the community quarterback in this effort. And as you can see, it's, it's a complex role. A, these, these are not big organizations, but they play a critical, uh, they're, they're the crit critical element in, of success. And the reason for that is they're the ones that tie all of these partners together, whether they be education partners, development partners, your health and wellness partners, the community stakeholders, the leadership and the residents of the community into this blue circle, which we, which we call, we have labeled here as the community compact. So it's a joint vision among all of these uh, stakeholders to deliver the vision of the neighborhood um, and ensure that it, it is done with fidelity. So the community quarterback is playing that role, while at the same time, it's also identifying resources and assets that are really brought primarily, from, in this case, uh, in most cases, from the pri uh, public sector, whether it be uh, MOUs with the school district on, on the management of the school, whether it be uh, tax credits, um, housing authority assets, whatever they might be, Community quarterback is helping to bring those to the table and have them delivered. And the reason why this is hard is because all of those entities um, may have made different decisions on how they deploy those resources had they not seen the other participation in these efforts. So this is about leveraging resources. It's, it's about uh, getting folks to make investments because they see others are making investments. And that's really the, the key to, we think, changing the trajectory of these neighborhoods. So one of the things we say is, you know, co-location does not mean collaboration, which means just because people are working in a neighborhood doesn't mean they're collaborating, it doesn't mean they're rowing in the same direction, and they're still, that doesn't mean that they're actually getting the full advantage of each other's investment. So the community quarterback's role is to really pull all of those entities together behind this shared vision and to make sure that they get delivered um, with fidelity. Um, the last thing I'll say is that these organizations, as I said, are, are small, but they're also, um, um, long-term, so this is not a two or three-year entity that we're talking about. We're talking about something that will, that will persist because we certainly believe that if this neighborhood is going to, if this work is successful and this neighborhood becomes very healthy, you will have a private sector response into this neighborhood that will threaten the affordability of housing. And so you've got to have somebody who's worrying about that. And as much as I love housing authorities and uh, economic development agencies and city governments, you can't rely on the public agencies to focus on a single neighborhood. And so in the long term, the role of the community quarterback is really to make sure that this successful, healthy neighborhood with this high quality education pipeline and all these services and amenities are continue to be accessible to low income folks. And that's, and, and that's really what this community quarterback will do um, in the medium to long term. In the short term, it's about getting all this work done, which is hard enough as it is, but in the long term, it's, it's maintaining the vision and, and, re and really ensuring that this neighborhood becomes success remains accessible to everybody. And David, that has happened in those communities where you're, those 23 communities where you're up and running? Absolutely. In fact, we are, uh, just to give you an example of the role of the community core back long term, in our flagship project, we're breaking ground on another phase of mixed income housing so that we can continue to raise the floor of affordability in the neighborhood, add to the stock of housing that's affordable 23 years into that project. And the only reason that's being done is because you had an entity who was, in, who was really whose business it, it was to worry about that. That would not happen in the, in the absence of that community quarterback. Am I saying it needs to, you need to be in place 23 years? I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is that there is a long-term 
goal that needs to be focused on um, by, by someone. Good question. Commissioner. Thank you for the presentation. It's very interesting, and of course, uh, and, uh, our priority is to stamp out poverty. Uh, I have a couple of questions, though. Um, full disclosure, I live a stone's throw away from the Orange Avenue apartments, and for 30 years, I've watched programs come and go that, you know, sounded good. We're going to do these things, and we're still in the state that, that we're in. So um, my question is, where, what is this? What has the citizen engagement been? Because I've not, I've heard you met with the school, you met with some health professionals. Uh, what are the residents saying, and do they understand what this all means, what this process is? Because we've been talking to them about what Tallahassee Housing is trying to do, and a lot of there's a there's a lot of talk in the air. There has been a lot of talk in the air, and I think residents may be a little confused about who's doing what and what's for their betterment. So I'm wondering what has been the engagement with the residents in South City uh, regarding this particular project? Well, th there have been a, a number of touch points, but the, the most, I think the most important has been the public housing process that Columbia Residential ran through. I mean, they did community uh, meetings, uh, at least four of them that I, that I can recall, where, they, um, where the residents were brought in to talk about the vision for the entire neighborhood, not just the property that the public housing authority controls. Um, there have been touch points with um, key stakeholders in the neighborhood. One of the things that philosophically we would, um, the way we approach this work is to be very careful, to your point earlier, uh, Commissioner, about the promises that have been made and not delivered against in lots of these communities. And we, in fact, we encounter that really everywhere we, where we work. And so one of the things we're very deliberate about is to make sure that you don't go to the community with any real plans until you've figured out what it is you can deliver. And so this due diligence process, which takes us this number of years, is really intended to surface those things that we can, we have confidence that we can finance and we can implement before you start going to community meetings and making announcements about what it is we, that you think you can get done. And, and that's, a, that's a philosophical point. We have found that to be very successful because then you're having very meaningful conversations with residents about specific things that can be done, and what you really want them to do is to own them and shape them to, to suit the, their specific interests and needs, but you, you don't want to start that conversation until you've actually got something you can you think you can deliver. And to, the, to your point about the, um, the engagement that occurred with Columbia, I attended some of those sessions, and so what I saw were people who had a lot of hope, dreams about what, what they like to see. Um, and that's, that's, that's great, but reality, um, I don't, I'm not sure where things are, what, what, they've, what they've heard since those um, sessions, uh, what, what, what is really going to happen. I know that there was an organization that, had already, that was already formed in that uh, neighborhood, and um, I think that Marie Bryant was, what was the um, neighborhood uh, head of that particular organization. So when you say you've spoken to some stakeholders, so um, representatives, who are the stakeholders in, in this community that you've spoken with about, about this? Well, um, Marie, you know, Whole Child Leon and, and Marie and the South City Revitalization Council have been at the table um, from the beginning um, as we have continued from those meetings and as, we've, uh, as these guys have come to town. Um, and that, you know, that's an ongoing process. Um, and we are putting together, um, you know, this is a, when we were in Orlando for the um, Purpose Built meeting, um, it's an issue that every one of these communities deals with. And I think what the first, one of the first things that or Lift Orlando did once, once they became a part of the network was to figure out how best to empower and engage the residents. I mean, they had, they, they had a very concerted effort um, because ultimately you want residents to be sitting at the table as uh, at the community quarterback table, but you have to, in, in many cases, um, I think David would, would attest to this, you have to build the capacity within the neighborhood, and that's one of the first things that they did in Orlando, and that once we get to that point, I think we would envision doing here, is to build capacity in, within the South City neighborhood, just like others have done in Appalachia Ridge and all around the community. So the request for funding, is that to... Um bring um, some of that resident leadership 
to the table as a part of the quarterback organization? First thing we need to do is have the resources to hire a permanent, someone who is whose job it is to wake up every day and and be implementing all of the facets of this um, of this process. I mean, so it this one exact that would be one of the things on the list of the executive director. But I think we need to. Um, it's hard to hire somebody without having the resources in place um, to to bring them on board. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I think that's that's where purpose. Once we get to that point, we're, we're sort of at this chicken and egg situation where um, to to have someone who's driving this every day, we've got to have the resources. Um, and we have to have that entity in place to contract with purpose-built communities, and then purpose-built communities can then help us put that strategic plan in place. Number, you know, number one on that list, I, I you know, one of the most, the first things we would do is set up that that long-term process for community resident engagement. The other way, the uh, main way to combat poverty is to provide some income to the to the people. So that's why I'm asking, will um, the residents be able to um, participate in a process that will allow them to also be hired or earn money to help with this project. Do you have examples of that? Absolutely. So there's um, one of the, what we hope one of the results of all this work in, in all, everywhere we work is to create a healthy environment for investment and that creates jobs. And so whether you're building a YMCA that has to hire folks or whether you're building um, redoing commercial facilities or retail facilities, jobs should come to this neighborhood and there's no uh, shortage of ways to ensure that the residents in that neighborhood have first shot, first, uh, shot at those jobs. So we have examples throughout our, our, our network of folks of specific job development programs that have been put in place for the residents to ensure that they get the first opportunity to take advantage of the employment, the employment that's created as a consequence of these investments. And as you know, you can do, you can source all kinds of, of, of projects and work as you go through this process. Um, but the key is, is they trigger that investment. And that's what's the key, the, the first three years or four, three to five years really is to get those investments underway so you can create this opportunity to support economic development for the residents in the neighborhood. Thank you. Commissioner? Uh, Representative? Oh, well, just real quickly, I think uh, David and, and Lorraine did a great job. And, the question I always ask myself is, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm getting over a cold, but how do you crawl, walk, and run at the same time? And anybody that knows me, I don't like wasting my time. And, uh, and I thought that this was uh, a great program model because what it did, it, it, it integrated uh, the right stakeholders at the right time at the table without creating illusions to folks and giving false hopes and expectations. And I'm really big on that. And so... I think we're in the early stages um, to position ourselves long term. And so instead of shoving something down someone's throat, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to do it, we're going to be able to integrate them into the process in a very well thoughtful way. And then the community quarterback, you know, you cannot teach what you do not know, you cannot lead where you do not go. If you look at many of our community quarterbacks, they serve a very unique role. You have many of them that come from um, um, integrated in the community, the philanthropic community. Uh, some of your uh, uh, civic uh, components of the community. And I think that particular entity, this community quarterback organization that we're creating, will be able to steer the ship in order to get the right stakeholders at the right time involved in the process so that we have a collective vision uh, to move this particular area forward. And so I think we're in early stages, and I think um, we will absolutely be sensitive. And I think you know, that's where my role comes in, it being my district to make sure and working with all of our commissioners. I know we have several commissioners that live on the south side and live in that area uh, to go to them and say, hey, this is not what we're trying to do, but here are resources and capacity in place. Now help us steer the ship so that we can make it become reality. Dr. Bryant? Yes, let me follow up. Let me first say I think this is an awesome idea. I think I've told everybody that, that has uh, raised the, the opportunity and you probably all know I'm, I'm big on planning. Um, and I think it's going to be critical. We, we, you have your quarterback group. Do we, do we know some of the people already identified? Want me to do that? Yeah. Okay. So we have gone through a very long and exhaustive, I'm used to saying thank you, Mr. Chairman, and being able to talk. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, we've gone through a, a very long, extensive list and identified uh, individuals that we feel uh, bring the diversity to the table um, in, in, a, in a walk of uh, perspectives, 
And so from an education background, uh, Iris Wilson uh, will play a critical role. Uh, Dr. Brenda Jarman, uh, who's uh, a stalwart in our community with some of the social work communities, bringing in Florida A&M University and Florida State University. Uh, Pastor, Pastor Quincy Griffin, uh, who uh, is the pastor of one of the larger churches on the South Side, as well as former band director at Rickers High School. We have Marco Bryant, uh, that speaks for itself. Uh, Darnell Smith, who brings in some of our uh, um, business community folks to support us. Uh, Derek McGee, uh, Rick Carney, Kim Williams, Christy Henry, uh, and Daryl Parks. And of course, uh, Steve Evans. I think we have a star-studded cast of individuals um, that are focused on not egos, but we go. Um, that understand that real change is long. It, is, it takes time to get to that point. This is not going to be a microwave type reality where it just happens overnight. Uh, and they're prepared to integrate their resources, put skin in the game uh, to make sure that this model not only impacts South City, but we can take these best practices to move them to other parts of our community. And I think that's the thing that really intrigues me about it. Um, you know, we should be focused on not trying to build walls, but tear down walls. And one of the things that I saw, Commissioner Richardson, in the meeting with some of our health care providers is that they're competing, but it's not coordinated. And, 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 and I think that, that speaks to some of our educational resources that we have to break down silos. Uh, we have a lot of duplication of services. And getting people to work in a coordinated, comprehensive way will be to the better good of all of our citizens. So all of these individuals have agreed to participate in the quarterback, on this quarterback? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we've had we've had we've had extensive we've had extensive meetings uh, and uh, made some very direct asks to them, and you know I get asked to get involved with things all the time, uh, and um, I've thought long and hard about this myself, and I really feel like this is a very good use of my time, and uh, it's a very worthy project that I think is going to bring forth a lot of quality outcomes for our community. I have strong reservations about that, Derek. <laughs> Derek, <laughs> you guy. I don't know. Oh, Derek. hey, Derek, good to see you. Well, and, I have to give world. a caveat because he was checking with his wife, so I don't. You know, <laughs> the fact that he's here, maybe, maybe she said yes. Good to see you, Reverend. Uh, I'm going Dr. to Bryant. continue. Oh, I, sure. I yeah, never yeah. did even finish my. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> your first question. <laughs> my first question. Oh, sorry about that. That's okay. No, you're you're fine. Um, I was going in the direction of. We do need to get someone to lead, someone full-time committed to the project. That's what they wake up living and breathing. Because unless they, that person, gets in place and we actually develop a plan to move forward, we will not. Uh, so, I, and I say that, and I don't know under what auspices the funding will occur, whether it's the, a collaborative effort between city, county, um, the quarterback group uh, in their role as uh, business leaders and, and philanthropic opportunities. But that has to happen, I think, before we're really ready to push out from the station. Um, then secondly, it's going to be critical that on the community quarterback group, which is high-level group of people, uh, that someone from the community they may not be able to raise one dollar, but their face on that group is going to be critical because it provides the connectivity back to the community. Uh, I think that's going to be important. So I'm excited about it. I'm, I'm ready to kind of get the, the ball rolling, but I know if we don't uh, put four wheels on this, it's going to fall. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Several things that I wanted to address. Um, one was throughout the, the and, and I'm I'm a very big proponent of purpose built as well. I have been a part of the discussion from almost the very beginning, uh, and I know that that our former mayor Andrew Gillum and and I believe County Commissioner Nick Maddox both visited the site in Atlanta and came back with just glowing comments about what had been accomplished there um, and and of course though we're not in Atlanta I believe that the same thing can happen uh, here in Tallahassee uh, in a, an, an area that we have uh, uh, identified as a distressed neighborhood but what it suggests it's distressed because the old model of clumping people in housing projects did not work but I think where we are moving towards the, with the housing authority 
uh, and mixing the low income housing uh, with the market rate housing, much like what they've done at Casanzas Village, uh, is the right model. Uh, and I think will go a long ways to helping to turn around the neighborhood as well. But during that, that, that whole process with Columbia Residential, there were residents involved in this process. Um, I remember uh, Marie being a part of that. Uh, Oliver Hill was a part of it. Uh, there were some residents. It, there were two older ladies. I, I think they may have been involved with the resident association even. Uh, they, they attended just about every meeting and gave input on behalf of the residents of the Orange Avenue apartment. So that kind of input was sought uh, and it was given. And they were not uh, shy pies either. Uh, they, they actually gave their opinion on where this whole process was going and what was needed uh, to help turn these things around. So that was there. Uh, the other thing in terms of uh, 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 Commissioner Williams Cox, I think you're absolutely correct that the residents, uh, wherever possible, are going to have to participate in this in terms of the jobs that are created. But in order for them to participate, they've got to have the training and skills to participate. Now, I'm, I, you know, you all probably know by now, I'm not shy in giving shameless plugs for Lively Technical College. But it's for real. I mean, we, we, I was talking to, as a matter of fact, Steve Evans this morning, and Steve told me that they have identified, I want to say something in the neighborhood of 2,700 jobs available in this region. 2,700, but we don't have the individuals trained for those jobs in the construction trades, in the healthcare industry, in auto. Uh, automobile mechanics, uh, diesel mechanics. They're just not there. I'm trying to get a roof put on my house, and I talked to the roofer. He told me it's going to be four months before they can get to me. Four months. And he said he's working as fast as he can and hiring as many people as he can, but they just they don't have the training. And so that's going to be key to getting people involved in that process as well. Now, when it comes to the funding, uh, I think there is a role for the city and county to play. And I know that you all, there is, Mr. Manager, and you, you and I talked about this the other day, and asked for the CRA. But I have to tell you, I will be opposed to those dollars coming from the CRA. Uh, as someone who's been here uh, and heard all of the issues of the fact that we uh, 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 have, have not put money into those areas uh, that are in desperate need of infrastructure development, uh, and then we take almost $230,000, which is, I think, the ask for three years. From, the, from the CRA for three years, uh, uh, when we've got lots of needs in those neighborhoods. And, and South City was one, as you know, Michael, that I fought for for four years to get included in the CRA because I knew that th that kind of investment needed to be done in that area as well. Uh, so, so what I would suggest is that the city and county, uh, Mr. Manager, uh, uh, come up with those funds but not take it out of those CRA dollars where you know, we've got neighborhoods that are in desperate need of infrastructure development. I, you know, I was through South City just the other day as a matter of fact, and on Texas Street, where we have an apartment complex, there are no sidewalks that connect Putnam and uh, Polk Drives. And I saw families walking in the middle of the street and mothers pushing baby carriages in the middle of the street because there are no sidewalks on Texas Street. You know, I, I fought. One of the first things I did when I came to the commission was fight to get sidewalks on Putnam and Polk. We haven't gotten there yet. We're in the process of getting it done. Uh, but but that's the kind of infrastructure development we need in those neighborhoods. And I just can't see taking those dollars and using them for personnel costs. Because there's nothing in personnel costs that address blight and slum. And that's what the statute de forming the CRA specifically addresses. And so I would, I would have personally, and I would certainly hope that my, my colleagues would agree with me, that we should not take dollars out of that uh, CRA budget uh, for personnel costs, that I would hope that 
between the city and county, we could find those funds uh, in other areas. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, Commissioner Mallow. Thank you. Just want to back up to the previous question on the. I didn't get all the names on the board of directors. Is there an existing resident um, from from that uh, on there? So, so the way the structures are going to be set up, there will be um, advisory committees and cer certain cohorts of issues, and and so this is kind of like the uh, the callous group that's going to form out, um, so we can build out the capacity, some of the philanthropic, and connect the dots. Uh, and so there will be a, a silo for you know education, uh, you know community engagement faith-based community, and we're going to draw uh, those individuals from that. However, I know this is a still evolving process, and I think uh, it is very warranted, especially based on what you're saying, uh, to have several individuals from the community involved with the community quarterback aspect of it as well. Uh, so this is just the um, kind of the, the trigger uh, to the rest of the process forming and having more engagement from the community. Yeah, I think that would be critical to, to let people know that they're in the driver's seat if there was room on the board to include an actual resident. Uh, I agree. That yeah. would be great. Um, back to the money topic. Uh, you know, I, are, these are consistently funded by private dollars. I know there's been some public input, but generally that's the method of funding. It's a mix, um, and it really just depends on the kind of local circumstances. As you, as you know, some cities have very large philanthropic sectors that can, that can help support this work. Corporate foundations and uh, those kinds of uh, entities can help fund this work. You see, on, on actually on slide eight, if you want to look at this, is the kind of list of sources that we've seen used in various community quarterbacks from around the country. The, the pie chart is referencing our project in Columbus, on Columbus, uh, Ohio, which was it really put the all public sector uh, supported. So you have it kind of across the entire spectrum, um, but the the the, the trick is really just to leverage what you have locally and what, what assets you've got and you're kind of, you're kind of forced to rely on what you've got locally. There's no, so there's no model that can work everywhere. Okay. And I agree with Commissioner Richardson on, on the CRA's focus. Yes, and, you know, I, I think, you know, that, that funding source is limited and, and maybe not be the best place to be uh, tap into. Um, the other concern about um, just the city and county's function is this is another um, nonprofit outside of a budgeting cycle. Um, and what president are we sending as far as that? I know that's a discussion I think we'd have coming up into the next budgeting year of, you know, what process we want to put in place for these and make sure we're sticking strictly to it. Um, with that being said, I, I, I think um, there is room um, for this year to just kick it off. I'd really be concerned about getting in, into any type of recurring um, funding um, going forward at, at this point, but I think we need to see a lot more interest from the private sector. You know, I think... GoFundMe said Tallahassee was one of the most charitable cities, and you know we just came out of a campaign cycle with millions of dollars of contributions. So I, the money's out there. Um, I think when we get the quarterback um, set up, you know they, they need to reach out and see how much more money um, they can bring in. Uh, so I, I would be in support um, of finding uh, a funding structure that at least um, provided funding for the first two years to get the, the agency established, um, and then. Um, Try to lean on the private sector a little more and see what the other opportunities are. Mm -hmm. okay. Representative, onto that now. Just, just to your point, um, you know, we we are having um, pretty down the path with conversations with Florida Blue. Um, TMH has already put some seed money in, um, and uh, Wendy Walker, who some of you may know, who's the former um, head of Leadership Florida, who's got a lot of connections throughout the state. She's also serving on the um, community quarterback, and her she's sort of agreed to be my development director to help us identify um, funding, you know, a, a continuous um, a revenue stream that doesn't rely um, solely on public dollars. I mean, that that's sort of the commitment of that community quarterback group is, you know, let us get off the ground, but we we will be committed to making sure that we can keep us off the ground. Yeah, that's that would be what I think I said. When you're talking about 20-year uh, companies that I've been into, uh, you know, I, you know, we don't want to get drawn into that. But you know, from my personal perspective, I like to see it get off the ground and get started. So. Commissioner, I, I, thank you for your comments. I am just I'm sitting here trying to think how can we how can we do this with these precious dollars that we have that have already been allocated for for this year, and and you know trying to do sidewalks, do public safety, do a, a lot of the things that we have to do as a city. Um, 
I would need more information, to be perfectly honest. I, I, I like Commissioner Bryant, I need a plan. I need a plan that includes residents and what they've had, what they have to say. Because what we don't want to do is because they're paying tax dollars too. We don't want to use those precious tax dollars and they have no say of, about it. And it's not something that they, they, they even can either um, embrace or have a lot of interest in. I think there's a lot of education that's, that's needed. Whether you're able to do it or not, I think before you even go in there to do it, we need to let them know what is being considered. Because I'll tell you that you've said it's majority African American. And if I can translate what that means to me in my, in my growing up, when you see people in your neighborhood who you don't know, who don't look like you, you don't know that they're there to help you. And if you didn't ask, if you didn't ask them what they need, then how do you know what they need? I know this is a great model, it, look, it looks good, but it's requiring, it's a three stool. It's requiring the education piece to work. We don't have an agreement from the school board yet. It's requiring the health piece to work, and it's requiring the housing piece to work. So uh, what are we doing if, if as a city we go ahead and commit dollars for personnel, not brick and mortar, not programs, but for personnel, and we don't know if we, if that investment is going to um, be um, joined by the commitment from those other pieces. So I just need more information. I need to know that the, that the superintendent and the school board, they're really on board so that we know that these dollars are an investment and not take the risk of being out there by ourselves. Dr. Bryant? I think it's going to be critical, and I'm really talking to my fellow commissioners, that until we invest some money, and maybe not in a full-time employee, but maybe even contractually, and do the basics to develop the plan, we will not be able to move forward. I, I agree with you that we do need to ensure that the people that are major stakeholders are part of, can actually say, yes, I'm supporting this. The superintendent, yes, I'm supporting this. Check those boxes. But then it becomes very critical that we go ahead and at least invest the money that we have budgeted to get the process started. Because otherwise, I think we'll be two or three years from now uh, talking about this is a good idea. You can't move forward until somebody does some research and get things in place. I, I don't think, and I'd like for you to actually respond to this based on your involvement with other communities that have been successful. I think you have some success stories to tell about African-American neighborhoods that have invested in this process and came back with positive results. So I think that we can tell a story that is reflective of who we are that will resonate with people that could benefit from the project. But it, it does have to be planned. Yeah, and I, and I think just to um, reflect on what Lorraine said earlier, this is a bit of a chicken and egg issue. You, it's never obvious when it is time to go ahead and get, launch this community quarterback organization. It's more art than science. We, we're here today because we think you're ready. We think you're at a point in this process that it, it not only is it um, mature enough and, and we're confident enough that you're actually going to have an implementable plan, but that you actually need somebody to be pushing it forward. And so um, now whether that's you know, a week, a month, three months, you know, that's more of a judgment call. But we do think you are at a juncture where this should be seriously uh, considered. And, um, you know, it, it's uh, the, the challenges here, you're, you're, you're trying to get public funding to get this thing launched. I understand that the demands that are being that are placed as a former city official, I understand those demands uh, intimately. But uh, I, I would argue that these investments will address many of the things that you're all worried about, things like you know, infrastructure. I mean, the, the, this, this is a way of driving those kinds of investments into this neighborhood. Um, it uh, it's not, may not be as obvious early on as building a sidewalk, but it is, uh, we would argue, going to create much bigger investments in this neighborhood that will abound to the benefit of those residents um, in, the, in the medium term. But it just, it, just, it just takes trying to get this thing kind of underway. Yeah, and, and David, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you on that. The city builds sidewalks outside of the CRA. 
but the CRA dollars are for that specific purpose. Uh, but I'm, I agree with, with uh, Commissioner Bryant. Uh, I'm supporting the funding for the position because doing it with volunteers and them doing it when they can, it, it may never get done. And so I, I agree that we need a dedicated staff person to live and breathe this to interact with the residents of the Orange Avenue apartments on a daily basis, to organize them, to get their input, to bring them along as this project progresses, with the re even with the redevelopment of the Orange Avenue apartments themselves. Uh, so I'm, I am in favor of that uh, and would support the funding for that from the city. Uh, uh, and and, and I, I agree with your estimation of where uh, Tallahassee is. I mean, you've got experience with uh, 68 developments that are at some point in the process, either up and running or developing. So I don't question your expertise uh, or your your assessment of where Tallahassee is in that regard. I, I think we're ready for it. Certainly we know the need is there. Uh, and, and I think this is now is the time to move forward because the more time, the more you put it off, the conditions certainly aren't going to get any better. Uh, they could even get worse. And so I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of supporting the initiative as, as Commissioner Bryant uh, has indicated, uh, but, but my thing is just not to take the money out of a dedicated source of revenue for infrastructure improvement. Okay, before I recognize uh, uh, Commissioner Williams-Cox, a couple comments because we have two hours left and we also have another item on the workshop agenda. We'll spend as much time as you want, colleagues, on this. I'm just trying to be mindful of the yeah. time. What I'm hearing is there's general support, okay? Yeah. So today, the, you know, I look for a motion to move forward. Now, for me, this is what I'm looking for as well. So when we talk about the allocations of dollars and we talk about the community quarterback organization, that's all fine and good. But when we stroke a check, we have to stroke a check to a specific organization. Who is that organization? Are you creating a new 501c3? Are we gonna use a 501c3 that's already pre-existing in this community? Who is that organization? We cannot commit dollars without knowing who we're stroking a check to. So between now and moving forward, here are some of the answers. Number one, what is that strategy? Pre-existing organization or a new organization? Number two, while uh, Commissioner Matlow is correct, we do have flexibility for mid-year funding to consider for 2018-2019. This commission cannot legally bind a future budget. So what we're looking at is it would actually be, if this commission was interested, we would do a mid-year funding request, which I share the same concerns, Commissioner Matlow, about opening up Pandora's box halfway through a budget cycle. We do it for one organization. Everybody in Tallahassee is coming to the table as well. That's something to take into consideration. For future funding consideration, it'll have to be part of the budget process. You're ahead of schedule. We've had the first budget workshop, so there's plenty of time to put that in consideration as well to move forward. But that would be the appropriate schedule for the budget requests. Um, number three, we need a detailed budget. We cannot just operate on, we need a quarter of a million dollars out of general fund. How's the money gonna be spent? Is it for personnel? Are we renting office space? Where's the office space gonna be located? Is it for programming? What does the programming look like? We have to operate, obviously, just like y'all do on the state level, complete transparency above board. The public has to know that if we're going down a new venture, exactly how does this play out? I'm sure y'all have this already detailed. I'm sure you have the paperwork. Just know that as we go through the budget process, we have to know all of the details. I share the same concerns about CRA funding. Um, we, we have had a lot of discussions about CRA and the direction that we want to have. That's not to say that we can't get creative and find the funding model specifically for uh, the purpose-built communities. I agree that I'm going to be a little hesitant moving forward with the CRA model. Okay, let's just get creative. Number three, I mean, number four or five, when we <laughs> get down to the private fundraising, which is a large chunk of the proposal, would love to hear more of your ideas on how to execute. It's one thing to say we're going to go out and raise two hundred thousand dollars. It's another way to say we're going to raise two hundred thousand dollars. This is how we plan on doing it. And so we need a little bit more of a sustainable fundraising plan in place 
just so that we know that we're not going to invest and then one third of the, uh, the funding is not going to come through. Okay. And then finally, we as colleagues need to take a hard look at our budget policy. It has, on my understanding is, it's the unwritten policy, or maybe it is written, but needs to be clarified, that if we go the route with pre-existing organizations, okay, if we don't create a new 501c3, we go with somebody that's already existing. We have to be careful of double dipping. If they receive funding through DHSP or a line item, and now we're coming back for purpose built. Not to say we can't do it, but we're going to need to clarify this policy. Mr. Matlow, it's kind of like the mid-year mid funding. Right now, we tell organizations, if you receive CHSP, don't come back and ask. Mm -hmm. If you receive direct line item funding from the city, don't come back and ask. If we're going to a model where we're using the pre-existing 501c3 in the community to expedite the process, they're already receiving money, and they're coming back for the new program, are we opening up Pandora's box? My, what I'm telling the city manager is this is something in general anyway. Mm -hmm. I would love for us to clarify during the budget process of how do we handle direct line item funding for nonprofit agencies in the community and how do we handle policy for those that receive CHSP funding but come back and are looking for new programming um, and how do we move forward from there. So those are my thoughts in general. I think for the purposes of today, we're going to entertain a motion to move forward, gather more information, and when, uh, when appropriate, staff will bring something back to us. Uh, of course, I'm interested in hearing what y'all have to say, and we'll entertain any motions put on the table. I just, I those just are had, my comments in general. I just had a question of clarification that there's currently not a budgeted line item for this, and I think you, you spoke to that about the mid-cycle budgeting. So just wanted to be clear, there is not currently a, a line item in the budget that will address this. So it would have to be some type of uh, amendment to, to make that happen. Is that correct, city manager? Yes, ma'am, that's correct. But it also depends on what is the agency that's requesting the money for the program. Okay? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Whole Child was mentioned, great organization, okay? If we used Whole Child as the 501c3 to get the quarterback up and running, okay, which could be very well the perfect fit, does Whole Child receive city funding? Does it receive CHSB funding, okay? If so, you have an organization that's making a mid-year funding request for a new program, the quarterback, but we're using the 501c3 structure. Does that make sense? Or what if it's second harvest? Or take your nonprofit. That goes back to the original point of what is the official organization that is asking for the funding? Mm -hmm. So when we find out who that organization is, then we'll have a better idea of the situation we're in. Representative. And I can answer that now if you'd like. Are we sure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, no, no. So um, the South City Revitalization Council okay. is, is a 501c3 that Perfect. has two things underneath it, the iGrow Garden and the South City Sports Club. So it's already serving the neighborhood. We've that organization. The, the agreement was made amongst the steering committee at the time to rename that the South City Foundation. Um, and to repurpose the bylaws for this, it, we haven't done it yet because we haven't, you know, sure. but that is, that's the plan. So it would be the Excellent. South City Foundation. Great. Can I ask you a question? The, the, um, I'm familiar with the Southside Revitalization Council. Um, the, and those, the current members of that uh, council have agreed to this. They, yes, they have. We, like have, it, we haven't done it officially yet because we didn't have the new members yet, but we, but that they have agreed to it. We, it's just hasn't. This meeting hasn't happened where it's take, that's taking place yet. Is there a motion to uh, accept the staff's report? I would move that we accept staff's report. Uh, 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 Mr. Mayor, now I'm, I'm not quite clear on what the ask is at this point because it was my understanding that without the CRA funding that it would be city county. So I, I don't know what that ask is at this point. David, can you maybe clarify that? Or Michael, what, what is the fiscal ask from the city at this point if we didn't include the CRA well, as a funding source? The original was for, for over three years with 100000 from the city, 100000 from the county. Um, I think it was 170000 for from the private sector and then 230 from the CRA over that three-year period. Mm -hmm. So Based on the feedback, we would need to go back and restructure and figure out how we re 
And that's based on a preliminary budget, our sample budget, which Purpose Built has provided to us that basically says you should look at, at having about $200,000 a year um, available to operate your, your, um, your community quarterback, River, and they have a detailed budget, which we will provide them to at the next at the next opportunity. Um, and this does a couple of things. First, it's based on experience. The other is is that level of funding certainty gives you the ability to recruit an executive director um, that will come in and be able to make a commitment because they'll know that they're they're making you know they're taking on a responsibility that's more than just six months of their commitment. But that's so what I from my hearing is is that we will have to go back. And, and kind of recon figure out how we would repackage this. I do need to point out that the county is considering um, next week a, a similar request. Mm -hmm. um, they are, and, and they are, I suspect, will have some of the same conversation that you're having. They were looking at that the request for them was again $100,000 over three years, split in 50, 25, 25 increments. I think we should ask them for 300,000. <laughs> <I'd understand. laughs> Absolutely. So, Mr. Mayor, I would move that we accept the staff report uh, and that we direct the city manager to bring us back a recommendation on the funding based on this recalculation. There is a, there's a motion on the table and a second. City manager just um, um, uh, did mention uh, a clarification. We are not moving forward with consideration of CRA funding. They need that right. clarification. Yes. Okay. Are we clear I'm on the clear. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Mayor. Brian, any final comments? Uh, okay. Dr. Uh, uh, Commissioner Matlow? Yeah, I'd like to see, um, just have those questions that we've asked yeah. addressed before it comes back. Um, I think ideally I'd like to see it be a 50-50 partnership between public and private funds um, going into it. And I just want to make sure um, the address of the entire commission the concerns of the entire commission are addressed before we take that vote because, you know, I, unless it's unanimous, I don't want to do it. Yeah. Okay. All right. All those in favor of the motion on the table signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you, you coming much. back down from Atlanta. My Thank you for all the fine work you all are doing in the legislature. We'll see you soon. All right. We're on to 3.02. Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Commissioners, as staff comes forward and we change out, um, I'll queue up this item. This is, uh, you have a pretty thorough agenda item in front of you. This came up at your December uh, 2018 meeting where there was a desire of the commission to learn more about the possibility of, or, or the framework necessary to create a municipal fiber optic utility or broadband utility selling internet services. Uh, staff has put together an analysis having to do with uh, state regulatory requirements, looked around the nation for some examples, uh, and looked very specifically in the state of Florida for, for some examples, and even given some estimate in terms of capital needs uh, in, in terms of what it may entail to have such a utility. Christian Doolin uh, is the lead on this. He's joined by Jason Lawrence, who's done a lot of work, uh, and their entire team. I appreciate their efforts on this, and so um, we're, we're prepared to give you an overview and we're looking for your feedback uh, uh, for potential next steps. Thank you, manager. So today, Jason and I will be giving a broad overview to enable a discussion uh, amongst the commission. Um, I would like to acknowledge my team, Anna, Diana, and Justin, who are here today, as well as my compatriots in T&I and Electric, who helped bring forward a lot of the analysis that you saw in the item and will give a succinct overview for today, recognizing the time. Um, nomenclature is important, so just to level that playing field before we jump in, want to make sure we're speaking, using the same words uh, correctly, right? So um, when we refer today to a municipal fiber optic network, first and foremost for a municipal network, uh, what, we're discuss what, we're, what we're talking about is a network that would be owned and operated by a municipality. Um, a few other key terms when we're talking about broadband, we're talking about um, the speed of internet that's 25 megabytes per second or higher, so a higher speed. And also um, just wanted to point out service provider in this context is whoever is going to be providing the retail service to the internet. Um, and that will, the importance of recognizing the distinction between the owner of the network and the service provider will become more apparent as we cover models forward. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jason who will um, kind of give an agenda for our conversation. 
Thank you, Christian. <clears throat> so when you talk about building out a municipal fiber network or utilizing your existing municipal fiber system, you need to take into consideration four factors. Uh, first, you need to look at your federal and state regulations. Second, you need to look at the kinds of networks that you want to build with that municipal fiber network. Third, you need to look at the cost of such a network. And fourth, you need to look at the existing market for internet service providers in your area. So very briefly on federal regulations, uh, nationally internet is regulated by the Federal Communications Commission, otherwise known as the FCC. And that started in 1996 with the Telecommunications Act. And in recent years, that federal regulation has evolved. Um, as you may know, in 2015, it was classified, it being internet, was classified as a public utility. And in 2018, more of that regulatory authority was passed down to states. So when we start to look at the state of Florida, the ability for municipalities to utilize their existing municipal fiber networks for broadband internet or to build one from scratch um, is pretty tightly regulated. So in 2005, the legislature passed section 350.81, which established some requirements for mun municipalities looking to build uh, broadband networks. Um, some of those requirements include uh, profitability in four years, uh, you may not price the cost of the internet service below the cost of actually providing it um, to any of your customers. You also aren't able to subsidize or cross-subsidize any of your rates. So that means that you can't charge one group of customers a higher rate to lower the cost for another group of customers. There is a 100-day uh, public hearing process. Um, and during that time, you need to examine things like cost, feasibility, um, and the service area that you're going to provide uh, internet in. Um, there's also an Avalorum taxation requirement. Um, you actually have to pay property taxes on the assets associated uh, with your municipal fiber broadband system. You may not use the power of eminent domain uh, to actually build out that system. And finally, uh, the internet service is gonna be restricted to the electric utility uh, service area for your local government. So that obviously makes it very difficult for municipalities in Florida to be able to build municipal fiber networks to provide broadband internet. And of the four major uh, or larger municipalities that we've identified, which include Gainesville, Ocala, Fort Pierce, and Palm Coast, each of those built those networks before the 2005 regulations. And it should be noted that no other city in Florida has been able to move forward with such a system since that time. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Christian. Yes, one other thing I'd like to note um, on on other municipalities, um, we did kind of look in recently to Quincy's network, which also um, which also came online around the same time as Palm Coast in 2005. Uh, that network, flop. It, yeah, that it was a flop. That network did, yeah. So in 20, 2014. That network. Um, Is that a technical term? Yeah. Oh, I'll leave it's it at that. It's in statute. I had it. Okay. Okay. Inserted in statute. Well, well, I, I will say no more. Um, other than that, right now, after Hurricane it, it Michael, they are um, reinvesting in fiber yeah. network to serve their meters. Yeah. When we consider models, um, industry analysts frame these models in four along a continuum of four types. Uh, the first model, and we've we've laid those types out with some of those municipalities that we just addressed um, in the last slide. The first will be a public service model. That is, a, um, the municipality owns and operates a network that they serve other public institutions. They, they can act as a provider to schools, hospitals, uh, health centers, et cetera. The second will be what might be termed an open access network or a wholesaler um, where the network is in lease to service providers who provide direct to residents and commercial entities. Um, then maybe expand a little broad, to expand a little broader would be a retail model that focuses on commercial developments, maybe lots of fish in, in a concentrated barrel, um, maybe, but stepping short of door-to-door. Uh, -door. And then finally, a, a broader retail residential model that's going full residential with businesses. Um, both the city of Gainesville and the city of Ocala are commercial retail providers, and they're gradually exploring residential markets in, in their areas. Um, when discussing the retail residential model, the, model, the city of Chattanooga, advance the slide, um, typically serves as a, a commonly referenced municipality for comparison. So we wanted to just address 
a little bit of um, the background there. So the issue that Chattanooga residents faced was virtually no broadband internet access due to the city's location in the mountains. Um, this, the opportunity they had uh, in 2009 was access to American Recovery Act grant monies uh, to build a 6,000 mile fiber optic network. Um, that money amounted to $111 million. The total cost for the network was around $280 million. Um, and that's at roughly about $47,000 per mile. As a point of comparison, Chattanooga's land area is 143 square miles. Um, Tallahassee's is 103. And the population of Chattanooga is uh, around 180,000 compared to our 190,000. So again, that would represent a full re residential model. Um, when considering rough order of magnitude cost estimates for a more um, targeted approach to retail provision, ISP, um, we have interested um, competitors in the market that are newly looking at our, our market, our local market, and initial cost um, estimates they're looking at investing is in the range of 110 to 150 million. So still, um, you know, still in the order of tens to hundreds of millions of dollars for the retail commercial investment. Um, we've, we've conducted a rough order of magnitude um, estimate here for full retail uh, in Tallahassee, and, and we used our electric T&D lane miles as a proxy just to get some directional estimates of what this could look like if we went into a full door-to-door -door model. Um, our transmission and distribution in electric it amounts to 3,700 miles of, um, of, uh, on the system. Uh, roughly half of that is uh, overhead. Roughly uh, half of that is underground. And using a cost per mile of $31,000 uh, per mile overhead for fiber and $121,000 per mile for undergrounding fiber optic, um, it, it puts a rough order of magnitude of around $283 million. So again, that's um, kind of a, an initial cost estimate. It's certainly a short of a deep technical feasibility analysis that would provide nuanced sharp and pencil estimates, but hopefully enough to begin the conversation here today and, and um, look, seek your direction. Finally, the last slide is very, uh, hopefully you have a print, you do have a printout, uh, it's very detailed. Um, this is, um, when considering a municipal fiber network, it's important to examine the existing market. Um, so this analysis is, is actually a point of requirement for the business case as per the 2005 statute. So an initial um, look here shows, um, you know, roughly 15 or so providers. Uh, there are five providers in our market that claim at least 97% uh, coverage or higher. Um, MetroNet at the bottom that uh, they are, look, they're another provider that is looking to enter our market. Um, and, and as far as we understand, that would be what I've just described as a retail commercial model, so targeting de concentrated developments within our community. And, um, and that would be a, just, again, a general overview of our existing coverage and um, alternatives in our market. With that, um, we look forward to entertaining any questions you might have. I appreciate the opportunity. Before we get into questions, Mayor Pro Tem, I do think we have a couple people from the audience that would like to speak on this issue. It, okay. Is anybody here interested in speaking on this issue? <laughs> Mr. Watts, please come join okay. us. Name and address for the record, and I need you to submit a speaker's card when you're done, if you don't mind. If anybody else is interested in speaking on this issue, please fill out a speaker's card, and uh, Mr. Lutz can take care of you. Thank you very much. My name is Paul Watts. My address is 3411 Capitol Medical Boulevard, and I'm the CEO of Electronet Broadband Communications. And I don't know where the information came from that we have just 75 megabit of service. So um, I'm just curious as to where this idea came from mm. in terms of where the city decided to, to play in the broadband market. Just curious. Um, I'm a, I've been a CLEC since 96, since the Telecommunications Act came out. We were the first to deploy high-speed internet with DSL in 97. Um, I've had experience of dealing with city utilities, pole attachment agreements. I'm a, I'm a customer. I pay these pole attachment agreements. 
I look at the existing fiber optic inter infrastructure here, and there is a good one. There's a, there's a good bit of fiber in, in Tallahassee. But I've tried to lease four fiber pairs on a 96-count fiber from the city on a major run through Tallahassee, and I couldn't do it because the fiber's in bad shape. So I think, first of all, is trying to figure out how do you pay for all this. The numbers are big. The risk is high. And how do you play on a, on a fair playing field all across the board? How is it fair to the local business owners, such as myself and, and, my, and, my, and my competitors that are in this room? I spent two decades building a fiber optic network. And, and, and I've raised my family here. So this, this is, we've got plenty of competition. The city of Tallahassee, it, 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 it is not meant to compete on a broadband market. We're a telephone and internet company and we're local. And we administer local service 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and there's a lot to do in it. Last night I was on the phone solving a problem for a customer here in town at 1130 at night. You're going to have that 24 by 7, 365 support needed to run a broadband network in your community. Um, you know, how do we pay for it? Where does the money come from? And what, what's the, as you look at price models and you look at the variety of services that are being offered by a multitude of companies in this community, it's going to be tough to compete. There are some real aggressive pricing structures that are out in the marketplace today by some very large companies with some very deep pockets. It's scary. I don't think it's right. I appreciate the opportunity. If commissioners, if you guys have any questions, just to, to know the truth, I'd be happy to meet with you and talk to you. Uh, I'll fill my information card out, uh, Mayor, and, and do everything right. I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I wish you guys all the luck in, uh, in getting this thing taken off your, off your table. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Watts. Appreciate it. Is there anybody else from the public that cares to speak on this issue? All right, we'll open it up. Mr. Mayor, Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, I first of all, won't, I don't want anybody from the city of Quincy or Gaston County to think that I took light of their issue. Gaston County is like a second home to me. That's where I started my professional career, and but for the wonderful citizens of Gaston County, I would not have had the opportunity to serve this community uh, in the state legislature. So. Uh, I, I don't take that lightly, but I was very involved in the county during the time that they implemented uh, their broadband service, and it was for a very legitimate reason. There are There is a d digital divide that exists in that county. There are remote regions of the county where the current uh, service provider, which is Comcast, uh, was not reaching. And so they wanted to try to address that issue in their county. But it never really got off the ground. It was never fully implemented. And I'm sure for many of the same reasons that have been talked about in the presentation uh, here this morning. And so there, were, there have been very legitimate reasons why that uh, uh, project uh, did not go forward. And, and it hasn't. And I... I'm not sure at this point if they've abandoned it 100%, uh, but I know that the roll forward, if it hasn't been abandoned at this point, has been scaled back significantly uh, in the city of Quincy. So I, I, I don't want anybody to think uh, that I made light of, of the very serious issue that they were uh, 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 attempting to address in their county. I guess the, the two issues, and, and our speaker have addressed it, because these are the things that came to mind for me as I read this backup material, is number one, why would the city of Tallahassee want to com compete with private industry when we've got 18 providers in the market, uh, uh, four of which uh, saturate the market, 100% coverage? Um, I, I, that... I can't answer. I mean, maybe, Commissioner Matlow, I know this was an issue of yours, and maybe you can address this issue when you're, you have the opportunity to speak, but, but that, that is the one thing. Um, and if, if, if the issue is to address this digital divide, I know that Comcast has had a program in place for a number of years. I helped to champion it in Gaston County, as a matter of fact, uh, through the school district. 
uh, to assist low-income families in purchasing computer equipment uh, and, pro and providing discounted rates for those families to be able to have internet access. So that's in place. I can't speak to the other providers because I've not worked with them uh, from that perspective. Um, and then the cost. I mean, hun hundreds of millions of dollars to simply build the infrastructure uh, for a, a business, literally a business that would compete uh, with already existing private industry, I, I just cannot get my arms around that. Um, and what does that do to what we've established as our priorities for the city through our retreat? Public safety, economic development, you know, protecting our environment. Um, and so what does that do for those priorities as, as these millions of dollars, because they would have to come from somewhere in a finite budget. Uh, and so my question would be how would, even if we were interested in something like this, uh, where would those costs uh, come from? I know the city uh, has addressed the issue of uh, internet access uh, because we have internet in our community centers uh, uh, and, and in our parks. The library has uh, access to computers and internet in the county libraries. So that issue even has been addressed from a local government perspective. I, I could not, in light of what we have been presented here this afternoon, uh, support the city of Tallahassee moving forward with, with a venture like this where it, it's going to be very difficult well, it takes away funding from what, it would have to take away funding from what we've identified as our priorities. But at the same time, we're, we're competing with, with private industry where we've already got 18 providers providing those same or similar services. Um, and so I, I Commissioner Matlow, help yeah, me okay. understand where we're going okay, with this. Yeah. Cause, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm not on board with it at this point. Commissioner Matlow. Sure, let me, let me try to start by uh, answering the speaker's question of okay. um, wh where this idea is coming from. And I think you know, this is something we're seeing um, more and more cities um, take interest in. Um, I know the city of Bartow just recently approved a pilot program um, to roll out um, customer service. But I think really the idea comes from, from the community and you know, they're, they, so often we get bad customer service or bad actual service, and there doesn't hasn't really seemed to be um, a private sector response to really address that and provide. So it, it begs the question: um, in something so important as the internet, does a city have a role to play in it? And I think when you look at cities who have implemented it, um, rather than see um, the competi the the competitive scare off the competitors, what they actually did it caused them to provide a better service. Um, you know, c competition is good, and too often when we limit ourselves to just um, one or two, um, we, we give rise to some of the customer service and technical issues um, that, that we've been seeing. Um, so the cost, I, I think rolling out, uh, you know, full retail ac across the city at hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, yeah, that is scary, uh, but um, this comes in many different scales. You know, a, a deployment of like that, I think, would um, cause considerable heartburn uh, for, for the private sector. Um, so, you know, we'd, we'd have to be um, wary of, about that. And I, I, so I think, I think that's higher than, than maybe what we're, we're trying to come out of the gate to suggest. But I mean, we still have to look at, um, do you have n numbers on how much uh, service coverage you can get um, over a, a gig of service um, outside of the fiber? So your question is, I mean, just so higher speeds and, uh, yeah. you know, you have DSL and fiber kind of combined together, but um, I know at uh, Midtown Pies, it, it took about um, nine months to get um, CenturyLink to be able to deliver fiber service by the time they got it to our building. So I just wonder how widespread um, those higher speeds are really um, throughout the community and especially segments of the community. Sure. So we haven't conducted, a, you know, coverage in the community. What I could comment is that when you look at so um, kind of you see the quantity and then look at the type of service as a quality. 
um, if you look at satellite cable and fiber, um, all can all might market up to a gig of speed. Um, when you look at the potential of each of those technologies, fiber would have a potential, a potential runway well beyond one gig, right. whereas the others, they're at kind of the top of that runway. So we haven't done a map or the coverage, um, and those coverage uh, numbers are cited mostly from, um, and Jason, you correct me if I'm wrong, but those are from the marketing material of those companies. Okay. So when we're looking at 98%, 97% coverage by uh, Comcast and CenturyLink, um, that's probably mostly cable and DSL service. No, no, sir. That's actually broadband internet. But but it's is it is it at the level that fiber could deliver in the future? Yes. So you're saying we have 98% coverage of a fiber network from? Is that correct? Am I asking that correctly? So. You, Please restate the interpretation. Okay. Uh, so when we say there's a 98% coverage um, by Comcast, yes. um, we're saying that they can deliver a fiber level speeds at 98% of the city? We say fiber level speeds if you're saying one gig, what? that would be true. Okay. If you're saying the northern end of fiber, we'd need to know the split of their network that would be fiber versus cable, and we don't have that right. split right. today. But, but nor just by virtue of the technology, Fiber is an accelerated speed. The others are slower. Gotcha. Okay. So when we're looking at um, the infrastructure of what we need to be competitive and when we're looking at our priorities as a city commission and um, economic development and quality of life, I think, um, Internet plays a, a vital role in both of those. I know when we, we were talking about um, Mayor Daly, the airport, and uh, I think you brought up a really good point. It's, we need to be site ready um, when, when those companies want to come to town. And I think when we're looking at different areas where we're trying to um, attract that type of investment, we saw um, Amazon that, you know, they wanted to be fiber ready. This would put us in the driving seat to be able to um, control what type of speeds we deliver to different areas, what kind of businesses um, we're, we're able to recruit to Tallahassee. I think it could be a great um, um, precipitous economic development, but um, largely we also have to worry about being left behind. We're not normally um, the first um, city for people to think of to bring um, the top level speed. So when we're trying to connect in the tech, compete in the tech industry in the future, we need to be, uh, you know, if the private sector is building other cities and higher speeds better, those companies are going to go there first. So we have to make sure um, we're laying the infrastructure. And, you know, just like roads, because this isn't infrastructure for the next 10 years, um, the speeds of fiber can um, uh, provide the service that we'll need 10, 20, 30 years down the line. So when we're, we're looking at those speeds and those investment and you compare it to other infrastructure like roads, you know, roads have costs that we have to maintain year after year after year. Um, but when we lay this infrastructure, we can actually see the return on our investment of laying it, have us better prepared um, to go into the future and, and even uh, potentially um, receive increased revenue um, for the city. So, I mean, that, that's kind of where the conversation's going for. And it's really looking to the future. Um, are we going to be there? Are we going to be ready to compete? And then you also have um, the digital divide. And I think you look at, um, you know, some communities have been able to blanket whole neighborhoods um, with inter internet service um, while they come up. So being able to um, look at those types of potentials, I think you're going to see a lot more cities advocating for this. And I think there may be some, some collaboration with the state government that we can push for um, to make it easier. Uh, recently, uh, the Commission on Status of Women and Girls also endorsed the idea of a municipally owned um, broadband network. So. Um, my other questions would just kind of be, for Mr. City Manager, for the city of Tallahassee, is, is this something our electric company, our electric center could do, or, you know, do we have the resources to be able um, to get into this effectively? Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Uh, Commissioner, I, I, I can tell you that we have a great deal of expertise in our electric utility uh, that we're very proud of, and I'm very confident uh, that they can handle that. Now, this would be a completely separate division. Uh, as required by state law, it would be um, uh, an enterprise fund that would fiscally stand on its own. Um, but in terms of the personnel expertise, it, of course, that exists. Now, fiscally, that's a that's a different story. Um, there would have to be a financing plan. Uh, the capital needs would be borrowed. Uh, some of those capital needs may come from the government itself today to get it started as you try to match expenses and revenues. So I could I can't speak to that today. Uh, I can't. Speak speak to our professional expertise and my confidence that we can expand that expertise to operate 
either a smaller or larger uh, municipal network uh, because of the scale of operation we operate today. Okay. I, I, you rarely hear uh, criticisms of the efficiency of the electric department and their customer service, so we appreciate um, the good work um, that you're doing there. So well, when we look a, across across other cities in Florida doing it, I think you mentioned Gainesville, I guess. They got tired of being beat on the football field, so they decided to get into broadband business. So, uh, you know, maybe that's where they want to compete. But uh, I, I'd like to hear, um, I, I'm by no means saying we should do this today. I want us to consider it. There will be significant pushback um, um, from companies, but I do think um, we should invite them to the table and see how this can, how we can all work together to um, have this future goal of really high speed connectivity. Um, across the city. I think we should open it up to public participation and, and see what you know our residents um, want to do. What do they think about the idea? Is it something we should do? And that should really be the, the driving force behind this. So um, as far as funding, um, we mentioned, I think it would be um, some sort of, um, we'd have to have a business plan in place to where uh, we're going to meet you know, our loan requirements. It would be outside of you know, funds we have on hand, obviously. And, and that, would that come significant risk? And we need to be I'm wary of that, um, but at the same time, we got to make sure we're preparing ourselves for the future, and that's my biggest thing. So my hope today would be um, that we could um, petition a, a feasibility study to just kind of give us the real in-depth um, details and, and different funding structures and different regulatory structures to see how um, and have that community engagement in the beginning and to see how something like this would look in um, Tallahassee without making any um, commitments, just opening the door for the conversation and um, getting some more information on it. Thank you. Commissioner Williams Cox. I would um, also want to speak to why would, why would the city of Tallahassee, anyone else want to get into this arena? And usually competition comes out of some bad experiences. And I will just say that um, uh, the current providers who shall remain nameless have, have have shown up in um, surveys to have provided very poor customer service. And um, so you start looking, when you start experiencing it yourself personally, it, begin, it, be, it, it begs to look around and see what else is available. And I have a personal experience with poor service from one of the providers, um, had, a, had a son who worked for them, and he was fired because he was spending too much time on the phone providing customer service. So if you don't want competition, then provide better service. And as we're looking at where the city goes next to the future, not just now, not just in five years, but to the future, if you want to be a part of that, start now providing good quality, timely service. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a running joke that, you know, you sit home all day waiting for someone to come out to help you out and as soon as you, you know, go somewhere, they show up. So we've got to do better. If you don't want competition, then provide better service. That's, I think that's the bottom line. So I, but I do support um, Commissioner Matt Lowe in let's, let's start the conversation. It may not happen now, it may not happen in our lifetime, but at least being the, um, the capital city of the third largest state in the nation, we've got to be forward thinking. And, um, Whatever it, it costs right now to be forward thinking, I'm on board. I know not not to the tune of the millions that we just saw. And no one's saying let's stroke a check today for that, but let's look at it. Let's let's research it, uh, determine the feasibility of moving forward with a plan or when it could happen five years from now, ten years from now, twenty years from now, um, and look for, for potential funding sources such as did I see being in the room, uh, such as Blueprint or other other um, funding sources that we may have available. There may be folks who may be interested in um, investing um, the, the, um, through some type of half cent sales tax or something, whatever, to uh, pay for this in the future. But the digital divide, even in this capital city, is deep. And we do need to address it because it does speak to the quality of life. You cannot go to a rec center in the middle of the night to do things that you can do at home if you have access to the internet. So those, those are things that we need, we need to consider. I would not want to have to go to a rec center or a library to do some of the things that we're doing no. in the middle of the night. Commissioner Williams, I was not suggesting Oh, no, 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 no I'm just saying. I was suggesting that we do, because a lot of our kids go to those centers 
after school in the afternoon, and mm -hmm. it is available for them. I appreciate there. that. I, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm right. just saying. And, and Commissioner Richardson, I, I didn't say anything about Quincy. Now, you know, uh, that's my hometown. <laughs> and um, I'll tell you that it was um, mind-boggling, well, earth-shaking when folks got access who did not have it previously. And I understand that you may not blossom as it should have, but it, it began the conversation, and those folks were able to go over to other providers so that now that they, they do have um, access, and it is uh, a world of difference. My 75-year-old aunt using her iPhone to access the Internet. So it was it was um, a great start. It may not have finished where it did, but Quincy, don't worry, I got your back. <laughs> and so does Commissioner Richardson. Always has. <laughs> Dr. Bryant? Let me say that I'm, I'm in favor of being futuristically uh, think we, we cannot stay in the space that we are now. We have to look forward. Um, but we have to do it in a very strategic manner. I think that it's worthy of conversation. Uh, I agree with uh, Commissioner Matlow that, that it's, it's worthy of putting on the table for discussion. I don't think we're anywhere near actually being in a position to make a decision. Uh, we need to start somewhere. Even in doing a study, that obviously is not a part of any budgeting process right now. But it's worthy of discussion in a budgeting process. So I think we probably need, not probably, we need more information. But I do want us to, to actually think in, in a forward-thinking manner because I don't think we're even in a position, if we wanted to today and had the funds to do it, to actually be competitive at doing it. That's not what governments do. So um, my two cent more. So I'm going to weigh in real quick. And first of all, Mr. Lawrence, this is the first time I've heard you formally present, and you've done a fantastic job on this item. I can tell that you've really researched <laughs> it, and I appreciate that. Good job. And Christian, of course, uh, you, you serve us well. Really appreciate it. This is a very detailed, complicated issue, and you gentlemen have done a fine job. Certainly do appreciate it. Um, I, I'm against this, and I'm ready to pull the plug right now on two different fronts. Number one, philosophical approach. Number two, on a financial approach. The city of Tallahassee, in my mind, should not be competing uh, in broadband, plain and simple. I mean, we've got private industry that is uh, here. They are providing. What, what I'm hearing is I don't like the service I have. I got complaints about the service. To me, that's not a reason to get into the business. Uh, that is a reason for us to work with our partners uh, to try to um, have a better experience. Let me also plant the flag right now, and I'm looking at a lot of the private industry that's here. I appreciate you being here, and I appreciate you doing business in our community, and I appreciate you investing as well. I, for one, do have business of providing um, uh, connectivity. That's just, that's just me. Number two, we cannot afford it, hands down. I don't want to even attempt to have a conversation in this community and let them even think for a second that we could actually afford creating a new utility without either a significant, I don't even know if we raise the millage rate to the 10 mil cap, if we can even still afford to put in the infrastructure, plain and simple, period. And what you referenced, Mr. Manager, is borrowing the funds, okay, which means debt service, which means bonding out for the infrastructure. That is not a priority to me. That is not a route I want to go. I don't think that when we look at the blueprint projects that we have been talking about for years that were actually vetted and approved by the citizens of Tallahassee, that there might be the opportunity or we might have to bond out on a project of those coming up in the near future. I don't want to affect our capacity to be able to bond out because we went in a different direction. $280 million literally represents one-third of the entire city of Tallahassee budget, both operating and capital. Actually, our operating budget is what, Mr. City Manager? 
our general fund operating budget is about $150 million this year. So the, the infrastructure alone would be twice as much as the entire operating budget this year the city of Tallahassee. We cannot afford this. On top of that, me personally, this is not a priority per se because the connectivity conversation we had five years ago is not the same that we have today. I'm looking at the private industry. I'm looking at the coverage. I mean, simply put, we have five companies in the private industry here in Tallahassee that covers 100 percent. or The lowest is 97 percent of the, the city of Tallahassee area, as Mr. Lawrence pointed out. Mm -hmm. We have the coverage. The question is the type of service, and I think that we should be good community partners and work with the private industry to see what we can do to help them provide better coverage if that is the issue. The bottom line is, is that if I've got $200 million laying around or $280 million laying around, or if we're even going to consider bonding out, I would rather bury power lines in this community, which is an issue that we have been talking about in storm related and the beautification of our city when it comes to the trees and the canopy. I think that is more of a priority if we were going to go the route for infrastructure, not putting in fiber optic, creating a utility to compete against the private industry, which is a high risk venture, as it was noted through the detailed analysis that was provided. So I'm ready to, and, and Commissioner Matlett, don't get me wrong, I really appreciate the creativity. I appreciate the thought process. Mm -hmm. I love the forward thinking. Um, I am also interested in carrying on the conversation to see what other technologies are out there that can help increase connectivity, whether it's through bringing new technology using light waves instead of fiber optics, which is currently being explored as well in the private industry. How do we move the city forward? I love the creativity and the thought process. I really do, and I appreciate it. This is just not the direction I want to go, and I really don't think we should carry on the conversation unless there truly is the opportunity that we're going to create a new utility, invest $280 million in infrastructure alone, and try to operate in the, and compete against the private sector. So, My thoughts. My thoughts. Commissioner Matlow. Yeah, thank you for those comments, and I, I think I can address um, many of your concerns. Uh, so the Palm Coast model as an open access network, they, they actually just um, lead the infrastructure, um, but it's the private sector that retails the service? They lease, so they're wholesale, as we right. understand. Right. So, so they're they're actually a partner um, in providing the service with with the with the um, with Palm Coast. The Palm Coast owns and operates a network, and they lease to the providers to the, to the private sector. Right? Yes. So, so they're working yep. hand in hand wholesale. to be able to, to provide that service. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, um, secondly, um, you know, the power lines is a, 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 a big discussion. I think there is an estimate of that costing over a billion dollars, um, you know, would be a noble investment. I, I don't think um, we have the funding sources to go through that. But if we were going to go down that line, it would seem um, a good opportunity to be able to share the expense and lay fiber um, along with buried power lines and so making sure we're creating as much infrastructure as we can. Um, so we're only um, digging once and not digging additional times to do this, but um, I do think there are emergency, emerging technologies um, that will come out, but um, the speeds um, that fiber can deliver um, over a single strand, it's, it's literally um, the infrastructure and the road of the future. We're, we're nowhere near the technology of how, how much data needs to go over those lines, so it, it's not even whether we're going to be, is a new technology going to come? Because we're, 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 we're far away from even how much can go over a line of fiber. So this is the, the path for, for how quickly things can expand. And I think, um, you know, as cities get into smarter technology and just having that infrastructure in, in the city's um, control will help, you know, not just service the customers, but, you know, how, how the city operates and finds efficiencies. And I think it's a big price number. And I think, you know, personally, I think, um, as we keep expanding roadways, that's, that's a very significant price. But this is something that prepares us for the future, um, gets a return on the investment rather than becoming a, a liability in the future. And, and I think if we want to be strategic about where we're going, we should at least consider it. So with that, I, but I agree it needs a whole lot more conversation. Uh, you know, this is just the t tip of the iceberg here, and I by no means am trying to say 
let's spend $20 million or anything, anything of that nature. But I, but I think we owe it to our community when we see what other cities are doing to make sure we're asking them um, if they want to be involved in the same sorts of things and make sure um, we are that forward-thinking community. So um, with that, I, I would make a motion um, to come back at a commission meeting, um, I guess with an RFP for a feasibility study to see what um, different ways a program like this could work um, in Tallahassee um, from the different ways you provided between full retail and open access networks and you know one significantly cheaper so we can see the price range um, see where the private sector can come in and participate with us and, and and just have a better idea of where we're going second good motion on table the second any further comment seeing none all those in favor of the motion on table signify by saying aye aye all those opposed no. aye and it passes three two do we have any other business for the good of the order before the workshop? No, sir. Excellent. We stand adjourned. We will reconvene at 4 o'clock for the regularly scheduled city commission meeting. Thank you.